All right, everybody, we will get started in just about five minutes. If you are just logging in, please keep your chat box open, say hello and where you are logging in from. I appreciate each and every one of you for joining. We are going to have a jam-packed high yield session this weekend. So definitely keep that chat box going, keep interacting and stay active and engaged. A lot of questions coming at you today. All right, everybody. Hope you all are doing well. Real quick in the chat box, if you can hear, see me and my slides, go ahead and type in yes into the chat box, please. Excellent. Wonderful. And we have people logging in, students logging in from absolutely everywhere. So I am so humbled and glad. Remember that if you missed our NBME Top Concepts Cardiology, which was done a few weeks back, I would definitely encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube channel and check out that video. Today, we will be covering endocrinology. As the classroom fills up, if you haven't already, just type in hello and where you're logging in from. It really pumps me up to see all of you logging in from all across the world for one purpose, and that is to succeed and learn for the USMLE exam. I'm going to go ahead and get started. As you know, today we will be covering endocrinology. But before I start, I did want to give each and every one of you a brief introduction. For many of you, this is the first time logging in to my webinars, but if you've logged in before, welcome back. My name is Rahul. I'm currently doing my fellowship in pediatric critical care medicine. And over the past six years, 
I have had an absolute passion about helping students just like you prepare and succeed for the USMLE. I am absolutely passionate about question strategy. I'm passionate about integrating material. And all of this has culminated to creating this wonderful project I call High Guru. And so just for a couple of minutes, I wanted to go through what makes High Guru, in my opinion, so unique. I really think that this is a great supplement to all of the resources which you're already using. All of those question banks and high yield books, this integrative approach of learning is what makes High Guru, in my opinion, so, so unique. I like to base all of my methodology in medical literature. I very much focus on active recall, and you will definitely see this throughout this lecture and many of my other lectures. I also like to integrate across organ systems. Today, what we're going to be covering is, hey, morphinoid habitus is seen in MEN2B. Let's go ahead and integrate every time you will see morphinoid habitus on the USMLE. Synthesizing that information is going to help with long-term retention. And most importantly, I like to focus on test-taking strategy, how you can take the content that you're learning from other resources and be very systematic in your approach and being very systematic in your methodology in applying the information. So apart from all of what I've just said, I like to give you a little bit of insight as to what my methodology is behind the USMLA preparation. And that is number one, I like to focus on content application and test taking strategy. I also like to make sure that students are in the peak positive mindset. And this is something I call test taking psychology. As many of you know, as you're going through your preparation, it is not just about making sure you crank through Anki cards or question blocks. It's about also staying positive and making sure that your mental game is as optimized as your content game. And finally, speaking of optimization, I'm very passionate about creating a productive integrative study schedule. And at the end of the webinar, you will see some of my sample calendars on my uh, Notion uh, template. I think most importantly, and this is a great representation today of what High Guru truly is, and that is that we are a community. I have been absolutely blessed to teach comprehensive USMLE courses live at top medical schools in uh, the Midwest. And uh, I'm so glad that now we have transitioned to a global community of lifelong learners. And this is just one of the many webinars that will be coming at you in the next few weeks. Uh, I am absolutely passionate about helping students and want to really also give you a background as to what inspired me to create this webinar. So this webinar is actually intended to capture the most recurring concepts from NBME practice exams. There was a great post on Reddit a few months back that highlighted the most recurring concepts that were seen on many NBMEs. I did take that same content outline to help us organize this lecture. And I have placed each of the different content specs into my free Notion first aid outline. So definitely check that out on my website. Like I mentioned, if you missed our prior lecture covering top concepts in cardiology, it's in my free Golgen style classroom course, as well as on my YouTube channel. So definitely check that out. And so without any further ado, I appreciate you guys sticking with me through that introduction. I want to ask you all in the chat box, are you guys ready to get started? If you are, go ahead and type in yes in the chat box. Awesome. Great. Lucas, Laura, Glenn, BC, Karen, Shanira, Frishta, 
Wow, we have so many people joining. Over 200 people signed up today. So keep your chat box open. I will definitely be getting to question and answer towards the end. And I would encourage you that if you can continue to type in some of the answers, again, this lecture is all based on questions. When you type it out, it helps you remember it a little bit better. So definitely keep that chat box going. All right, so today we are going to be covering some important USMLE concepts related to endocrinology. What I'm first going to be going through are signaling pathways of hormones. This is actually the normal physiology and the USMLE really likes to test the different mechanisms. We'll cover hyper and hypothyroidism. We'll go into parathyroid hormone and different questions related to calcium regulation. I'll also be covering the MEN syndromes, the multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes, as well as integrating some islet cell tumors that you may see on your exam. We'll then do a little bit of a compare and contrast related to type 1 and type 2 diabetes and the extremes of these pathology being DKA as well as hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state. Finally, we will end on covering diabetes pharmacology and I will go through some questions related to aldosterone metabolism. Ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you to be very active and engaged and pay attention throughout this whole session. It is a short, finite amount of your morning that I appreciate you showing up. I really want you to be engaged, go through these questions so that you at the end can really master the concepts related to endocrinology and think like the test maker. All right. So what we're first going to be going through is the hormone signaling pathways. All right. I first off want to give you a test taking strategy when it comes to hormone signaling. When you're talking about hormones for your USMLE, what you want to do is group hormones and their mechanisms based on where they are released. So what we'll be covering in the next slides are the hormones that come from the anterior pituitary, the hormones that come from the posterior pituitary, like oxytocin and ADH. We'll be covering thyroid gland. But remember, you need to know the location from which these hormones are going to be secreted. The next thing you should do is define that hormone and integrate the mechanism of action. Are they going to work on the G-protein couple receptor S, the GQ, the tyrosine kinase? Are they going to be an intracellular or intranuclear receptor? We'll be covering that in the next few slides. And then finally, just as a general USMLA strategy for endocrinology questions, always think about feedback. Go back to your normal physiologic negative feedback concept. And remember that when negative feedback doesn't work on the USMLA, it is known as pathology. So endocrine questions, the take-home test-taking strategy is think about feedback. Let's go ahead and start with a question. A 39-year-old man presents with severe writhing, back pain, hematuria, as well as nausea. An intravenous pilogram confirms the diagnosis of a renal calculi. So he has a kidney stone. The presence of strongly opaque stones on the plain film is suggestive of calcium oxalate stones, which have an increased incidence with hypophosphatemia. The renal clearance of phosphate is increased by which of the following hormones? I want to, as a kickoff for this webinar, ask you to put your answer into the chat box. Awesome. And we have a lot of people putting in B into the answer, uh, into the chat box, and you're absolutely correct. Remember, parathyroid hormone is going to increase calcium levels and decrease FOS levels. I like to think about parathyroid hormone, PTH, as phosphate trashing hormone. So we know that it's going to increase calcium and decrease your FOS. So now what I'm going to be doing is going through the various mechanisms of each of the hormones. Now, remember that the USMLE can ask you not only the hormone name, but they can say, does this hormone upregulate, downregulate a certain pathway? So when we're thinking about the anterior pituitary hormones, remember that 
FSH, LH, ACTH, and TSH are going to be your major hormones secreted from the anterior pituitary that work via the cyclic AMP or G protein coupled receptor S pathway. When it comes to the posterior pituitary hormones, it's going to be ADH hitting the V2 receptor. Remember that the V1 receptor is also going to have a relation to ADH, but the V1 receptor is going to be via GQ. That's why we call it vasopressin. However, the V2 receptor is going to be GS mediated, and that's what actually increases the aquaporins in the distal collecting duct, thus reabsorbing that free water. When it comes to calcium regulation, PTH, and calcitonin are both GS hormones. And when it comes to autonomic receptors, beta-1, which is found in the heart, and beta-2, which is going to be found in the lungs and the vascular smooth muscle, is going to have a GS type of mechanism of action. So what's really important for you to know is that, for example, if they say a patient has a ACTH secreting tumor, they could easily put on your exam increased GS activity or increased cyclic AMP activity. Now you know kind of how the test maker can pose these different concepts. And that's the goal of today's session. Let's go ahead and shift our attention to the GQ pathway. Now the GQ pathway, remember, is related to IP3 and the hypothalamic hormones such as your releasing hormones, are going to be GQ mediated. So GNRH, TRH, growth hormone releasing hormone. I also like to be thinking of hormones which cause contraction of vessels. And those same hormones will be related to the GQ pathway. Now, what's really important for you to know is that the GQ pathway, remember with IP3, you are going to get increased intracellular calcium release. And so that kind of makes sense that if there's calcium, you're going to get vasoconstriction. So angiotensin II is going to be one of those hormones. ADH hitting the V1 receptor. Remember, we just talked about ADH hitting the V2 receptor, but that was GS mediated. And then oxytocin. Now, just as a little bit of an aside and an integration, remember that the posterior pituitary releases two hormones oxytocin and ADH. ADH is going to be synthesized in the hypothalamus and ADH is going to be synthesized via the supraoptic nuclei in the hypothalamus. There's your neuroanatomy tie-in. Oxytocin, paraventricular. Please integrate those facts into your mind. And then which receptor is going to be GQ mediated? Well, you got it it's going to be the alpha one receptor primarily. And that one is also going to cause contraction of vessels. Very important for you to know that norepinephrine, phenylephrine, these are what we call alpha one agonists. And these alpha one agonists are going to cause vasoconstriction. So here's a little bit of a study or test taking tip, and that is creating webs of knowledge. So as you know, there's the GQ pathway and the GS pathway. And yes, you can go ahead and learn the process. And I think that that's going to be really helpful. But in a stressful test taking setting, you may just have some recognition and relations, just like a spider web, relations to the various components of the pathway. So for example, GQ, if you hear DAG, IP3, PIP2, protein kinase C, the USMLE is probably going for that GQ pathway. Similarly, if you hear adenylate cyclase, cyclic AMP, protein kinase A, if you hear those types of molecules or signaling uh, components, the USMLE is probably going to be going for the GS pathway. So now you have the GS and the GQ, your webs of knowledge, and make sure you revisit the hormones so you can actually understand not only where they're released, but the mechanism of action. I think that that's exceedingly high yield. So the next pathway that we're going to be talking about is the tyrosine kinase MAP pathway receptors. And the two major classes of hormones that are going to be released and signaled via the tyrosine kinase MAP pathway uh, uh, signaling pathway is going to be growth factors. 
So say, for example, they give somebody who has increased IGF-1 levels, say that they have gigantism or they have acromegaly, they can say upregulation of the tyrosine kinase MAP pathway, and that can be your answer. The other important one that acts via the tyrosine kinase MAP pathway is going to be insulin. And we're going to revisit that when we talk about diabetes, but I did want to put this in here for completeness sake, and we'll do a little bit of space repetition a little bit later on. There's also a family of receptors known as the tyrosine kinase associated jack stat receptors. Now the tyrosine kinase associated jack stat receptors, that is not going to be growth factors, but that's going to be more related to growth hormone. So make sure there you keep those straight in your mind. Immunomodulators like cytokines are going to be via this tyrosine kinase associated jack stat receptors as well. So they can easily give you some patient who has increased amounts of inflammation and they'll ask you, what's the signaling pathway that is going to be upregulated? Cell proliferators, remember in polycythemia vera, you get an increase in erythropoietin, for example, and that stimulates your bone marrow to increase your cellular production. And finally, remember that prolactin is going to be from the anterior pituitary, just like growth hormone. And both of these hormones are going to be jack stat receptor mediated. What were the other anterior pituitary hormones? That was going to be GS mediated, FSH, LH, ACTH, and TSH. All right. So speaking of hormones, the next portion of this, we will be covering hyper and hypothyroidism. I'll first start with a little bit of test-taking strategy to introduce you to this concept. When you're thinking about thyroid disorders, I want you to have a general categorization as you go line by line in these thyroid questions. Remember that if patients are revved up, i.e. they have tachycardia, they have isolated systolic hypertension, they have tremors, they have arrhythmias, they have exophthalmos, you should really paraphrase in your mind, man, this question is going for hyperthyroidism. And that then channels you in the right direction. On the other hand, if the question is talking about a patient who has bradycardia, who, for example, is going to be very, very cold all the time, or who is going to have hyporeflexia or even hypercholesterolemia, which is a very high yield one, you are going to be thinking of hypothyroidism. So the point here is that as you're reading USMLE questions related to the thyroid, try to categorize based on if they're revved up or slowed down, whether or not you're dealing with hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. Let's go ahead and go through this question. Here you have a 29 year old woman who presents with nervousness, heat intolerance, and weight loss. Laboratory exam reveals elevated serum T4 and T3 levels. So remember, they are high. While the serum TSH is decreased, this is a great point where you should integrate normal negative feedback. Histologic sections from her thyroid gland reveal increased cellularity with scalloping of the colloid at the margins of the follicle. Which of the following types of autoantibodies is most specific for this individual's disease? Go ahead and put this into the chat. And I want everybody to participate. That is awesome. We are seeing a lot of great answers. And the answer here is TSH receptor stimulating antibodies. Remember, this is one of the most common causes of primary hyperthyroidism, and that is going to be Graves' disease. Now, remember that Graves' disease can be categorized from an immunology standpoint as a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction because you have autoantibodies that are going to persistently be stimulating the TSH receptor. And that's important because then that's going to start taking out the thyroid that is going to be stored in the thyroid follicles. And that's why you get the scalloping of the colloid in your exam questions. So taking a step back, where is thyroid secreted from? Well, it is going to be in the follicles of the thyroid. And remember that this thyroid hormone 
is one of the only steroid-like hormones which are actually pre-synthesized and stored. Usually steroid hormones are made on demand. Unlike protein hormones, steroid hormones are going to be made on demand via nuclear transcription and then subsequent translation. But thyroid hormone is actually a steroid hormone that is going to be stored in the follicle. Now, what is the more secreted form? That's going to be T4. And remember that that's going to get peripherally converted via 5 prime diiodinase into T3. What is the rate limiting enzyme for thyroid synthesis. And that is going to be thyroid peroxidase. Now, thyroid peroxidase is going to take iodide and turn it into iodine, and that's going to be via the oxidation step. Thyroid peroxidase is then going to organify the iodine via attaching it to tyrosine moieties. And then subsequently, you are going to couple MIT and DIT together, mono and di to make T3, or DIT and DIT together, and that's going to make T4. So thyroid peroxidase, important for the oxidation, organification, and coupling of thyroid hormone. What is the mechanism behind thyroid hormone increasing basal metabolic rate? And that is going to be upregulation of the sodium-potassium ATPase. This could be asked in your question regarding Graves' disease, that her symptoms of hyperthyroidism is most likely related to which of the following mechanisms, and that is upregulation of primary active transport. See that integration? So we alluded to this a little bit at the beginning of this slide, but just so that you are clear, what type of receptor does thyroid bind to? And that is actually an intracellular receptor. Remember, thyroid hormone is going to be similar to a steroid hormone. And so I apologize for the typo of the slide. I'm going to be mostly talking about steroid hormones on this, on this slide. But remember that steroid hormones are going to have an intracellular or intranuclear receptor site. And the US Army loves to go for that. So steroid hormones are going to be things like your glucocorticoids, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, aldosterone, steroid hormones, intracellular and intranuclear. And the other ones that are steroid-like are 125 vitamin D, which is the active form of vitamin D, as well as thyroid hormone. Very important for you to integrate those two. Let's go ahead and talk about another high yield concept that comes up on many exams. And that is the relationship between pregnancy, i.e. high estrogen states and thyroid. Remember that pregnancy can also be mimicked by a patient on your exam taking oral contraceptive pills. It's gonna be the same type of vignette. So what they will ask you is a female on OCPs or who is pregnant will have which type of thyroid profile? And that is going to be a high total T4, but a normal free T3 and T4. What's going to be really important is that you understand that the high total T4 is seen in pregnancy and oral contraceptive use. The key point here is that estrogen will increase thyroid binding globulin, and thus that increases total T4 concentrations However, it does not affect the free hormone, i.e. your free T3 and T4. So if they ask you another question related to what's the concentration of TSH in this setting, the TSH would be normal because TSH only responds to the free T3 and T4. So remember that the free, T free hormones are always important for feedback. OCPs upregulate TBG, increase total T4. All right, we're going to shift gears and talk a little bit about hypothyroid. A patient with weight gain and fatigue complaining of weakness has heavy periods and deepening of the voice. What I really want you to integrate is this high yield one, the menorrhagia, the heavy periods related to hypothyroidism. What do you think is the characteristic of this patient's thyroid or lipid profile, excuse me, given the fact that he has hypothyroidism? 
And that is that the patient will have dyslipidemia, specifically a high LDL. A patient who has not seen a physician in 20 years presents with altered mental status and dry skin. Deep tendon reflexes are delayed and she has cool yellowed skin. She has non-pitting edema in her face and extremities. What's the likely diagnosis? Now, the not seeing a physician in many years indicates that the patient may not have had the appropriate screening or checkups. And so this is going to be mostly related to myxedema coma. And in myxedema coma, you will get a non-pitting edema due to proliferation of glycosaminoglycans and mucopolysaccharides. The US Assembly really wants you to know that both the deepening of the voice as well as the non-pitting edema is going to be related to the proliferation of glycosaminoglycans and mucopolysaccharides in the extracellular matrix. So when we think about hypothyroidism, remember that this is the opposite of what we talked about with hyperthyroidism. In hypothyroidism, you are going to have a decreased sodium potassium ATPase function. So these patients are going to be hyporeflexic. They may have constipation in the test question, and they will have a very slow heart rate, i.e. bradycardia. These patients will also have extracellular matrix proliferation, which we already alluded to, that causes you to have the non-pitting edema as well as the deepening of the voice. Finally, these patients with hypothyroidism are going to have dyslipidemia. So watch for that in your list of labs for your USMLA questions. When we think about hypothyroidism, the key USMLA point is going to be the following. In hypothyroidism, another thing to keep in mind is a high-yield psychiatry differential. And what may be the DSM diagnosis that may mimic hypothyroid? And on your exam, that's going to be depression. So depression and hypothyroid are going to have an overlap because both patients can have fatigue, depressed mood, weight gain. However, in hypothyroidism, you will see more of the somatic symptoms, such as constipation. In hypothyroidism, you will see decreased reflexes, and that's going to be more characteristic of hypothyroidism than it is depression. So one of the key strategies as you're studying is to delineate and compare and contrast two concepts so that you can tease them out on test day. One of the most common causes of hypothyroidism is going to be Hashimoto's disease. Let's go ahead and integrate this question. What are the antibodies positive on lab testing? And that is going to be anti thyroid peroxidase, and anti-microsomal antibodies. Remember that thyroid peroxidase was the rate-limiting enzyme that does the oxidation, organification, and coupling of thyroid hormone. What will the fine needle aspiration of the thyroid show? And that's going to be a lymphocytic infiltration with germinal centers along with characteristic Herthel cells. Now remember that Hashimoto's is going to be an autoimmune phenomena. And so if a patient in your vignette is going to have in their past medical history, Hashimoto's disease, always keep in the front of your mind, hey, the US Emily may be testing other types of autoimmune disease, i.e. they may be testing lupus, for example. They may be testing, oh, this patient also is going to be at risk for adrenal insufficiency like Addison's disease. So an autoimmune stigmata needs to be a blanket paraphrase as you're approaching questions. So as you can see, these are going to be the actual germinal centers and chronic uh, inflammation that we will see in Hashimoto's. And this is going to be a characteristic Herthel cell, which the USMLA can describe as large oxyphilic cells filled with granular cytoplasm. And as you can see, they have a prominent nucleoli as well. Another test vignette for you to integrate is going to be a patient who has Hashimoto's, but then has a rapidly growing thyroid. In this setting, you are really worried 
about marginal cell lymphoma, which is a subtype of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Remember, pathologies such as Sjogren's syndrome, Hashimoto's, those are chronic autoimmune processes. And chronic autoimmune processes are going to cause you to have a increased proliferation of your marginal zone. And after a while, the body gets irritated so much from the chronic inflammation that you can actually develop a cancer. And that cancer we typically call a maltoma, which is a subtype of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. All right. I have to shift gears back to hyperthyroid, and we're going to do a similar deep dive. A female presents with weight loss, tremor, and has palpitations and occasional chest pain. What psychiatric disorder may also be considered as a psychiatry differential? So if hypothyroidism was related to depression, hyperthyroidism can be related to anxiety. And Again, another key feature is that with anxiety, there typically may not be any weight loss. So again, somatic symptoms help you tease out the psychiatry diagnoses from your thyroid diagnoses. So the USMLE presentations related to hyperthyroidism are going to be the following, and we'll cover Graves in just a second, but here are some high-yield vignettes an obese patient who takes thyroid hormone for weight loss. This is an exogenous thyroid uh, administration. How about this one? A patient with hyperthyroidism can also get atrial fibrillation because the high amount of thyroid hormone can affect the electrical activity of the heart. So a patient who presents with palpitations may have a hyperthyroid-induced atrial fibrillation, and they may give you an EKG on the exam, or they may kind of integrate a Graves disease vignette. Very important as you're going through the material to always be thinking like the test maker. How can they ask these questions? How can I apply this information? And we have done already so many questions, and I hope you're kind of finding value in this review as we're covering it step by step. All right. So one important point that the NBME wants you to kind of integrate is how to approach labs specifically related to hyperthyroidism. So I want to ask you in the chat box to make sure you all are paying attention. Are patients with hyperthyroidism going to be revved up or chilled out? What do you all think? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Yeah, exactly. Everybody's like up and you are paying attention. Make sure to stay active and engaged. Revved up patients. So if you see in your vignette, a person who's revved up and you're suspecting hyperthyroidism, let's go through some important laboratory distinctions. So the USMLE will most likely give you a TSH and T4. Obviously, one of the telltale signs of primary hyperthyroidism is going to be a high T4 with a low TSH because of negative feedback. Now, say that you have TSH and T4 normal, well, then go down the route of anxiety, or maybe this is panic disorder. But now let's go into this a little bit more. When your T4 is high and your TSH is low, the next step the USMLE may want you to interpret is going to be an uptake scan. So when you get an uptake scan, you are trying to decipher, why does my patient have primary hyperthyroidism? Well, the uptake scan can show you low uptake, i.e. the thyroid is not taking any uptake, but the patient still has T4 high, TSH low, and signs of hyperthyroidism. And that low uptake is going to be related to subacute decorvain's thyroiditis, which typically presents on your USMLE as an upper respiratory tract infection, and bam, a week or two later, the patient is going to have signs of hyperthyroidism and a painful, painful thyroid as well as factitious administration. Remember that obese patient who was taking exogenous thyroid hormone. If you are going to take exogenous thyroid hormone, that's going to shut down your innate hypothalamic pituitary axis. The other uptake uh, uh, probability is going to be if you have a single hot nodule. And that then tells us that, oh man, my primary hyperthyroidism is going to be due to a toxic adenoma, which is secreting 
excess amounts of T4 and thus decreasing my TSH. You also want to be thinking about multiple hot nodules telling you that, oh, this might be toxic multi-nodular goiter. And then finally, if you see diffuse uptake on your uptake scan, that's going to be very characteristic of Graves. So what I do want to really highlight is this right here, when a patient has low uptake. And when a patient has low uptake and signs of primary hyperthyroidism, the test taking strategy and the mental model to keep in mind is that when thyroid is inflamed, it will not want to uptake. Remember, day vein thyroiditis or factitious in which you are kind of forgetting about the thyroid gland secreting thyroid because you're giving the thyroid, especially in some sort of thyroiditis type of condition there will be low uptake. Remember, we talked about diffuse uptake being characteristic for Graves' disease. Now, the USMLE points related to Graves' disease is that remember that this is a IgG that is stimulatory to the TSH receptor. What's important to find in Graves' disease is the exophthalmos. That's typically pathognomonic. And the mechanism is actually really important, and that is the proliferation of the retroorbital fibroblasts that then cause increase in glycosaminoglycans and cause the eyeball itself to bulge out. But that proliferation of retroorbital fibroblasts is exceedingly high yield. So what does the fine needle aspiration of the thyroid show? And in Graves' disease, it is going to be that scalloped appearance of the colloid. And so this is very uh, characteristic of what you may see. Remember that the thyroid follicles should kind of look like this in which they are going to be very circular. However, in this red color, you notice that the patient has the scalloped appearance. And that is basically a telltale sign that, oh man, I'm taking thyroid from the follicle and then secreting, taking thyroid, then secreting, taking thyroid, and then secreting. And that's characteristic of Graves' disease. All right, we have to integrate some pharmacology here. What is the mechanism of the pharmacological agents used in patients with hyperthyroidism to decrease thyroid synthesis? And that is going to be to block thyroid peroxidase. Remember, methimazole and propothiouracil block thyroid peroxidase, and thus they are going to be used in the treatment for hyperthyroidism just to integrate. What do we use for the treatment for hypothyroidism? We give them thyroid hormone. An important vignette, which you may get related to methimazole and PTU is going to be the following. So the patient has hyperthyroidism, is started on methimazole or propothiouracil, and now suddenly presents with fever and sore throat. What lab test may allude to the underlying diagnosis? Go ahead and put that in the chat. All right. We have a lot of people saying CBC or neutropenia, and you're absolutely correct. You want to understand that both methimazole and propothiouracil are going to cause you to have neutropenia. And thus, if the patient presents with fever and sore throat, that's a very concerning sign that there may be some sort of opportunistic infection that is related to the fact that methimazole and PTU decreased your immune fighting cells. All right, here's another question that relates to endocrine anatomy. A patient with a recent history of follicular thyroid cancer presents for post-operative evaluation after thyroidectomy. He is noted to have difficulty in articulation, speaks in a soft, muffled, and hoarse voice, and the question is, the affected structure is related to which of the following embryologic derivatives? So to summarize, this patient ended up having a thyroidectomy and now is going to be speaking in this very hoarse voice. Those are the keys to this question. This is going to be related to recurrent laryngeal nerve damage. And that is very characteristic after a thyroidectomy. And remember the recurrent laryngeal nerve is a branch of the vagus, and that is derived from pharyngeal arch number six. Ladies and gentlemen, if you need a brief review, please check out my YouTube channel. I do have a quick video 
on the pharyngeal arches, but very important, recurrent laryngeal nerve causing hoarseness derived embryologically from pharyngeal arch six, excess, um, excessively high yield. And what do you think pharyngeal pouch four and three, what questions are going to be related to that? Well, that's going to be related to DeGeorge syndrome. Remember that those patients are going to have hypocalcemia, some congenital heart defects. They can have seizures. And uh, this is due to the fact that they have abnormal development of these uh, pouches. All right. So speaking of DeGeorge syndrome and those uh, third and fourth pharyngeal pouches, we're going to be talking about PTH and calcium regulation. Are you guys learning a lot? Go ahead and put yes into the chat box. So I know you all are paying attention. Awesome. We've covered so many questions thus far. I appreciate you guys sticking with me. Let's go ahead and talk about PTH and calcium regulation. When we're talking about parathyroid hormone, where is parathyroid hormone released from? Well, it's going to be released specifically from the chief cells of the parathyroid gland. Now, what's important is that the parathyroid glands are right behind the thyroid gland itself. So there could be questions in which a patient goes for a thyroidectomy and inadvertently gets their parathyroids taken out. Remember that they are going to be derived from the third and fourth pharyngeal pouch. And what effect does parathyroid hormone have on the bone? This mechanism, very exceedingly high yield, but it is going to increase calcium and phosphate release from the bone. Now, the net effect of PTH is to increase calcium and phosphate trash, i.e. decrease your phosphate. But at the bone, it is going to increase calcium and phos release. So the mechanism is actually really important. And the first thing that PTH is going to do is PTH is going to bind to the PTH receptor on osteoblasts, and that's important. Osteoblasts are then going to make rank ligand. And that rank ligand is going to bind to the rank receptor on what? Osteoclast. So keep blast and class separate in your mind. So now rank ligand bound to the rank receptor on osteoclast. And with the help of IL-1, they create an acidic environment to increase PO4 and calcium concentrations in the blood. Another high yield test question is to recognize that osteoclasts are derived from the monocyte lineage. And the USMLE loves to go for that. So this is just a pictorial representation. As you can see, PTH binds to the osteoblast. The osteoblast starts secreting the rank ligand and the rank ligand binds to the rank receptor. Now, what's important for us to recognize is that you have this osteoprogerin. And osteoprogerin actually is going to inhibit osteoclast. Osteoprogerin protects the bone. And thus, it inhibits osteoclast from chewing up the bone. So why that's important is because premenopausal women have estrogen. And this estrogen increases osteoprogerin, inhibits rank and rank ligand interaction, and subsequently, you inhibit osteoclast differentiation, and that's why estrogen is protective against osteoporosis. So remember that postmenopausal women, just as a reproductive tie-in, are going to be susceptible to osteoporosis because of increased osteoclastic activity. So that's why we use selective estrogen receptor medications, such as raloxifen, to help preserve the integrity of our bone and prevent osteoporosis. Another little fun fact, denusimab, which is a monoclonal antibody, mimics osteoprogerin. And that's why denusimab is going to be used to help protect the bone from degrading. So again, guys, I like to go through the normal physiology, some pathophysiology, and then integrate the pharmacology because this is how the USMLE likes to test. These are how your questions in your question bank are going to test as well. So the key point here that I want you to understand is that estrogen protective against uh, uh, protective um, uh, ability on the bone. All right. Parathyroid hormone. Now, what effect does parathyroid hormone have on the kidney? Well, 
in the kidney, parathyroid hormone increases calcium reabsorption, and that's going to be primarily at the distal convoluted tubule via upregulation of calbindin. But remember, parathyroid hormone is also known as phosphate trashing hormone, and thus it inhibits phosphate reabsorption where? Well, that's going to be at the proximal convoluted tubule. And that's increasingly high yield for you to know that phosphate trashing occurs at the proximal convoluted tubule. Parathyroid hormone at the level of the kidney also stimulates vitamin D synthesis. And the mechanism here is that it increases 1-alpha hydroxylase, taking your storage 25 vitamin D and turning it into 125 vitamin D. So this is a summary figure that kind of recaps what we were talking about. We talked about PTH and how it affects the bone. We talked about PTH and how in the kidney, it is going to cause you to be more phosphaturic. It's going to increase calcium reabsorption and it's gonna activate 125 vitamin D. Now, if we dive in deeper, 125 vitamin D actually increases calcium and phosphory absorption from your intestine. And that's actually really important that PTH causes high calcium and a low FOS, whereas 125 vitamin D causes a high calcium and a high FOS. When we think about vitamin D, let's go into it a little bit more. So do you know the difference between D2 and D3? Well, vitamin D2 is primarily found in the diet. Whereas vitamin D3 is the form that we get from the UVB lights of the sun. The mechanism is that we have seven hydrocholesterol in our skin, and that is converted to D3 thanks to the UVB light. The storage form of vitamin D is going to be known as 25 vitamin D. And that particularly is going to be stored in the liver. Now then in the kidney, Thanks to PTH, you are going to get 125 vitamin D. So what effect does the active 125 vitamin D have on the gut? And that is going to be increasing calcium and phosphory absorption. When we think about some pathophysiology questions related to vitamin D, this is an important one. A patient with sarcoid on the USMLE may present with hypercalcemia. What is the mechanism here? And that is that granulomas have intrinsic 1-alpha hydroxylase activity. And so granulomas can actually increase your levels of 125 vitamin D. Let's go ahead and answer this question. A child presents with poor growth and recurrent respiratory infections. He is found to have a low vitamin D. His most recent admission was for pseudomonal pneumonia, and he also has foul-smelling stools. What is the etiology behind this low vitamin D? This is going to be a very important question. And when a child has poor growth, recurrent infections, and fat malabsorption, you're going to be worried about cystic fibrosis. And remember that pancreatic insufficiency can cause malabsorption of vitamin D. And vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. A, D, E, and K are going to be your fat-soluble vitamins. So there you go, a GI tie-in for you. All right, so this is going to be the non-caseating granulomas in sarcoidosis. Remember that these non-caseating granulomas have the multinucleated giant cells that are characteristic. And like we said in the last uh, question, that one alpha hydroxylase is going to be innately um, uh, activated within these granulomas. Now we're going to be talking about the extreme of parathyroid hormone, and that's going to be a parathyroid adenoma. A patient presents with increased thirst and constipation. He has a history of peptic ulcer disease and kidney stones. He has increased ALKFOS and urine cyclic AMP. Why does this patient have increased cal uh, cyclic AMP in his urine? So the beginning portion of this question is all focused on you recognizing stones, bones, and groans. The patient has hypercalcemia. Now, why does they have increased cyclic AMP? Well, that's because 
PTH, like how we saw in the beginning portion of this webinar, acts via G protein couple receptor S mechanism. So when we think about primary hyperparathyroidism, PTH is going to be high, and that's going to cause you to have high calcium, more phosphate trashing, and the MEN syndrome that's related to a parathyroid adenoma, that's going to be primarily MEN1. Remember, MEN2A, just a subtle point, is related to parathyroid hyperplasia, but you get the similar lab findings. And so now we are going to be talking about MEN syndromes. Now, the way that I like to look at MEN syndromes is via shapes. But before we go into MEN syndromes, let's go ahead and answer this question. A 23-year-old man sees a physician because he was awakened on several occasions by severe headaches, anxiety, and heart palpitations. Vital signs are within normal limits. On physical examination, he has pectus escavatum, a high arch palate, bilateral pes cavus, and scoliosis. He is noted to have oral lesions on the buccal surface. Which of the following laboratory measures would most likely be elevated in this patient? Let's go ahead and put this in the chat box. Okay, we have people saying A. Awesome. So the key points in this question for you to recognize is that the headaches, anxiety, and palpitations, the test maker is going for pheochromocytoma here. And this sentence is going to be all related to the morphinoid habitus and the oral gangliomas that you see in MEN2B. And remember that MEN2B is going to be related to medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, which is going to be derived from the cells that secrete calcitonin. So this is how I like to go through the MEN syndromes, and that is looking at the different shapes. Now, pretend that this is going to be somebody's body. An MEN1 syndrome is going to be related to pituitary, parathyroid, which is going to be near the neck, and pancreas, which is right here. And that kind of creates this diamond configuration. So pituitary, in which they can have pituitary adenomas, watch for your bitemporal hemianopsia, i.e. tunnel vision, parathyroid adenomas, and pancreatic tumors, which we will talk about in the islet cell portion of this lecture. When we talk about MEN2A, you're going to be thinking about parathyroid hyperplasia and bilateral pheochromocytomas that are going to have increased amounts of catecholamine. And then finally, MEN2B, you are going to have oral gangliomas and bilateral pheochromocytomas. Now, MEN2A and 2B are going to both have the RET oncogene mutation association, which is a proto-oncogene, and it is going, they are both going to have relationships to medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, which is going to be a tumor related to the parafollicular C cells and the parafollicular C cells secrete calcitonin. What's important for us to also recognize is that the morphinoid habitus is seen in MEN2B syndrome. So what I want to do is talk about how morphinoid habitus or Marfan syndrome can present on the USMLE. So Marfan syndrome, remember, is going to be a fibrillin mutation on chromosome 15. And when you have bad fibrillin, you're going to have bad elastin. And bad elastin means that you are going to have increased hypermobility. And thus, you can get a upward lens dislocation. You can have issues with the aortic root, and you can have spontaneous pneumothoraces. Remember that these patients are going to be very tall and lanky, but where else can you see the marfanoid habitus? Well, we talked about MEN2B, but another important one is homocystinuria. And here's a subtle point, that in homocystinuria, the lens dislocation is going to be downward and medial, whereas in good old-fashioned Marfan syndrome, it's going to be an upward and lateral dislocation. The next concept we will be talking about is related to the adrenal medulla. So what are the cells which secrete, or what, what, are, what cells secrete the catecholamines? 
And that is going to be the chromaffin cells. Now, the chromaffin cells are different from the enterochromaffin-like cells. And the enterochromaffin-like cells are seen in your GI physiology, and those secrete histamine. Both of these cells are going to be derived from neural crest. The primary, the primary hormone that is secreted from the adrenal medulla is going to be epinephrine. And the metabolic byproducts that are made after norepinephrine and epinephrine are going to be broken down are HVA and VMA. Now, HVA and VMA are elevated in pheochromocytoma. So really watch for that in your list of labs uh, for uh, pheos. So here's an example of uh, pheochromocytoma. A 30-year-old female presents with intermittent headache and palpitation. So signs of sympathetic being revved up. She is sweating profusely on exam. She says that this is not the first time she feels like this. So what do you think is the best next step? Well, this is kind of a vague question because hyperthyroid could mimic this. So I would need to give you more information, but pheochromocytoma, but even cocaine toxicity can have a similar presentation. And so, yes, you may want to get urine metanephrines, but in real practice, we would get a drug screen to make sure that there is no prosympathomimetic agent on board. So just as a little bit of a biochemistry tie-in, what are the amino acid precursors to catecholamines? And that is going to be phenylalanine and tyrosine. Remember that if we look at the biochemical pathway, phenylalanine becomes tyrosine via phenylalanine hydroxylase. And this is the step that is messed up in PKU. Very important for you to know. Tyrosine then becomes DOPA. DOPA becomes dopamine. And dopamine becomes norepinephrine. And then you have a methylation reaction that then allows you to become epinephrine. So that's why I said phenylalanine and tyrosine are precursors to your catecholamines. All right. We only have a couple more concepts to integrate, and then we will be done for today. The next portion of this is going to be covering islet cell tumors. Islet cell tumors, I do want to bring up two important cells, and that is going to be the alpha cells which secrete glucagon. Now, glucagonoma is a very rare tumor, but if it shows up on your USMLE, watch for patients to have necrolytic migratory erythema. So they'll have this red rash, cracking of the lips. Remember, glucagon increases sugar concentrations, so they will have very high sugars and they will have weight loss. Remember that the beta cells secrete insulin, and you want to be thinking of an insulinoma, another rare type of tumor, but the USMLE loves for you to know that in an insulinoma, you have increased insulin levels, but also an increase in C-peptide levels. And that increase in C-peptide levels helps you distinguish insulinoma from exogenous insulin use. Say that a patient has um, uh, Munchausen uh, syndrome, or they have some sort of malintent or malicious gain, they're malingering, they can actually administer themselves insulin and cause low blood sugar states. So how do you tease out insulinoma from factitious? You're going to be looking at the C-peptide. Now, what's an interesting for you to know, and this relates to the pathophysiology and pharmacology, is that this same high insulin and high C-peptide will be theoretically seen in oral sulfonylurea poisoning as well, because or OSUs are going to increase endogenous insulin. Another islet cell tumor is going to be Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, in which patients are going to have on endoscopy distal duodenal ulcers. That's very important because usually the duodenal ulcers related to H. pylori, for example, are going to be proximal, whereas distal duodenal ulcers is very characteristic of a gastronoma. Remember that that was related to which MEN? It was MEN1 syndrome. VIPoma. This is going to give watery diarrhea. And as you get the watery diarrhea, you're going to be very hypochloremic in your blood. Now, I do need to integrate some biochemistry related to insulin. What cell releases insulin? Well, we just talked about that, the beta pancreatic cell of the pancreas. Now, insulin is an anabolic hormone. So let's just integrate. What are your other anabolic hormones? Insulin, androgens, as well as growth hormone. These are all anabolic hormones. What they are going to do, and specifically insulin, is that the insulin is going to increase glycogenesis, 
by activating glycogen synthase and lipogenesis. And insulin, as a result, is going to inhibit keto acid formation. And I think that that is extremely important for you to know that insulin inhibits the synthesis of ketones. The USMLE notoriously can put a UA which shows ketones, and you need to interpret that based on the presence or absence of insulin. So what does insulin actually do at the biochemical level? Well, it upregulates glucokinase, it upregulates glycogen synthase, as well as the rate-limiting enzyme for lipogenesis, which is acetyl-CoA carboxylase. Speaking of insulin, let's go ahead and finish our last three concepts, and that is going to be related to DKA, then we'll shift to a rapid review of endocrine farm, and then we will end with aldosterone disorders. Both patients in your USMLE, if they have DKA or hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, HHS, both of these patients are going to have a dehydration type of stigmata in your test question. So what you need to do is recognize dehydration in your exam questions. Now you can look at your vital signs and you can see tachycardia as well as hypotension, plus or minus the patient having tachypnea. Remember that if you have really bad dehydration, you can build up lactic acidosis and lactic acidosis causes an anion gap, metabolic acidosis, and the compensatory response for an anion gap, metabolic acidosis is gonna be hyperventilation, which on your USMLE questions can be manifested as tachypnea. On physical exam, these patients are gonna have dry mucous membranes, delayed capillary refill. And if they're giving you a child, maybe they'll say no tears when crying, or they have a very sunken fontanelle. These are all signs and symptoms of dehydration that you will see in both in DKA and in HHS. So another test taking strategy that I'm going to go for right now is going to be the approach to diabetes on the USMLE. Now, typically diabetes questions are going to have the patient in your vignette being having polyuria, polydipsia, and plus or minus weight loss. So then I categorize in my mind, if the sodium and the urine osmolarity is all uh, out of whack, then you're going to be thinking of diabetes insipidus. But then if the patient has polyuria, polydipsia, and the glucose is out of whack, then you're going to be thinking about diabetes mellitus. So look for the lab studies to help you distinguish why you're having polyuria and polydipsia. As we know, diabetes insipidus, you have nephrogenic in which there's no response to desmopressin. Central, you're not producing it. Type one diabetics usually present on your exam with DKA and type two diabetics have a metabolic syndrome stigmata and they can present in HHS. All right, this is a very important question. Let's go ahead and read it together. And I want you all to answer this in the chat box. A 27 year old patient with insulin dependent diabetes mellitus told his roommate that he could not afford to refill his insulin prescription. When the roommate returned from a weekend trip on Sunday evening, he found the patient unresponsive on the couch with deep labored breathing. Which of the following arterial blood gases taken in the emergency department could be expected in this patient? So as a history of type 1 diabetes, not filling the prescription and now having deep labored breathing, what would you all think? All right. We have a lot of great answers. What I want you all to recognize is that this is an arrow type question. And arrow type questions, you're really going to have to go with the low hanging fruit, what you definitely know. And this patient has diabetic ketoacidosis. So what I know is that diabetic ketoacidosis causes an anion gap metabolic acidosis. So which one is going to be acidosis? Well, it's going to be one of these three. Then which one is going to support an acidosis? Well, a low bicarb is going to support a metabolic acidosis. And which one has an elevated anion gap? This one does. And why is the CO2 low? Because the patient is hyperventilating, we call kusmaling. Test taking strategies. That's where I want to really have you focus because you can get the information from other resources and other places, but I want you to really get good at applying the information.
please, if you have not uh, already checked out my YouTube channel, I do have a 10 minute video on the pathophysiology of diabetic ketoacidosis. I would be more than um, uh, happy to answer questions about it. However, I would really encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube channel and watch that video. All right, here's a microbiology integration. A patient with DKA now presents with facial pain and purulent nasal discharge. What is the likely diagnosis? All right, so in this test question, the patient has DKA and this sinus infection, and you're worried about mucor mycoses, and that's caused by mucor and rhizopus. And in particular, the morphology is this broad non-septate hyphae that branch at right angles, and it kind of looks like this. But remember that these are invasive sinus infections that are seen in patients with DKA. All right, so I want to compare and contrast DKA with hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. Now, typically in test questions, DKA patients are going to be type 1 diabetics, and thus they're going to be younger, whereas in HHS, the patients are going to have type 2 diabetes. In general, type 1 diabetes is all about lymphocytic infiltration of the beta pancreatic cell, whereas in type 2 diabetes, you're going to get insulin resistance and amyloid deposition at your beta pancreatic cell. The patients with HHS have a very high glucose, and that's something for you to really recognize and integrate. Patients with DKA are going to have a high glucose, but not necessarily at, the, at that very high level. These patients may be Kussmalling, they will definitely have an elevated anion gap, and serum ketones will be very positive in DKA. In HHS, these patients are acidotic, but to a lesser extent, but most importantly, they have very profound dehydration. And that's really important for you to recognize. In both pathologies, you're going to give insulin and fluid resuscitation. All right, let's talk a little bit about diabetic pharmacology. Just as a test-taking tip for tackling pharmacology questions, I want to bring your attention to the fact that when you see a pharmacological agent in a vignette, so they say the medications they are on are, always try to recall what is the mechanism of action of that medication. And that's important for you to note. Another subtle test-taking tip is that anytime on the USMLE you see greater than or equal to three medications, that indicates a drug interaction question. And that may be related to, oh, are they testing me on SIP because they're giving me three medications? Or do they want me to delineate side effects from each of those three medications? So just a subtle point, but again, test-taking strategy is going to be very helpful here. All right, very good. Which of the following pharmacological agents would explain his current laboratory state? A patient with FSGS presents to the physician for a routine checkup. The patient has been having increased weight gain due to steroid bursts, and he is noted to have elevated hemoglobin A1C and thus is diagnosed with diabetes. His most recent creatinine was high, and after initiating pharmacotherapy for the diabetes, he's noted to have an anion gap metabolic acidosis. So what medication did this? And you're absolutely correct if you said metformin. Remember, metformin increases the risk of lactic acidosis in patients who have kidney failure or kidney damage. Let's go ahead and talk about the pharmacological agents related to diabetes. Now, remember that you have oral sulfonylureas. Those are going to increase endogenous insulin. You have your biguanides, which are going to be metformin. You are going to have the thiozolidine dions, which is going to be rosiglitazone and pioglitazone. GLP-1 agonists are going to act like endogenous GIP and GLP. So exenatide is going to be the medication there. DPP-4 inhibitors are going to increase GLP levels. So DPP-4, normally DPP-4 takes GLP and turns it into inactive GLP. But if you inhibit DPP-4, you get increased GLP. So citagliptin sits on DPP-4. Alpha-glucosidase inhibitors are going to inhibit the brush border, and you're going to 
relate the medication a carbo. So a would means without, and then carbs, no carbs. All right. And then canagliflozin is going to be a medication that inhibits SGLT2 in the kidney. And so subsequently you are going to inhibit the proximal convoluted tubule from actually reabsorbing glucose. So what are some high yields related to this medication, these medications? The high yields related to sulfonylureas are going to be the fact that they increase the ATP sensitive potassium channel and thus increase endogenous insulin in your beta, uh, endogenous insulin release in your beta pancreatic cell. That's why these patients can get hypoglycemia or weight gain. Metformin stimulates AMP kinase and it decreases insulin resistance. We talked about the lactic acidosis. Rosiglitazone and pioglitazone activates PPAR gamma, and that actually also is going to decrease insulin resistance, but they have the tendency to actually increase the fluid uptake. And that's why if they have a, if you have a patient who has congestive heart failure, rosiglitazone and pioglitazone may worsen the heart failure. Exenatide is going to increase insulin secretion and delay gastric emptying. So I think of exenatide as extending the time that it takes for the stomach to empty. And so subsequently, you are going to get weight loss as one of the desired side effects. Citagliptin, again, is a DPP-4 inhibitor. It increases GLP-1. A-carbose is going to inhibit brush border glucose reabsorption. And thus, if you do that, the side effect could be diarrhea, bloating, and flatulence. And then finally, SGLT2 inhibitors are going to inhibit proximal convoluted tubule glucose reabsorption. You're going to be more glucosuric. And subsequently, you are then going to have an increased tendency for urinary tract infections because bacteria love to chomp on that glucose. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are at the end of our webinar. We're going to be talking about aldosterone disorders. An important test taking tip before we get started is to integrate what aldosterone does. Aldosterone brings in from the actual lumen of the collecting duct, it brings in the sodium. And that's via upregulation of ENAC channels. Aldosterone also is going to make you pee out potassium and hydrogen ions into the urine. Remember that aldosterone is a steroid hormone and thus it is going to have an intracellular or intranuclear binding domain, but aldosterone brings in sodium and makes you pee out potassium and hydrogen ions. So let's go into the two extremes as our last exercise. Addison's disease is essentially adrenal insufficiency. These patients are going to have characteristic tanning of the skin because of upregulation of POMC. And in patients with Addison's disease, you are going to be wasting your sodium because you don't have any aldosterone. Aldosterone is not there, so you're unable to pee out potassium and hydrogen ions, so they then build up in your blood. And because you are wasting sodium, you're going to get a low blood pressure and also a low pH because you have a very high H plus level. You can get in Addison's disease a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. So what's high yield is that adrenal insufficiency is also seen in congenital adrenal hyperplasia. However, in congenital adrenal hyperplasia, specifically related to the most common 21 hydroxylase, you're going to watch for not only adrenal uh, uh, wasting, but you're going to have abnormal genitalia. Con syndrome is going to be primary hyperaldosteronism in which you have an aldosterone secreting tumor, for example, that is going to increase sodium reabsorption. You're going to be hypokalemic because you keep peeing out your potassium. You're going to have a more peed out H plus. Thus, you are going to have a metabolic alkalosis. And because you're having a high sodium load, your blood pressure is going to be high. Like I mentioned, you're going to have a metabolic alkalosis. And remember that anytime I see hypertension and hypokalemia on the USMLE, I say, wow, where is aldosterone in excess? Hypertension and hypokalemia should make you think about 
oh, there is aldosterone excess. So is it a patient who has renal artery stenosis that has high amounts of renin? Is it going to be the patient with renal cell carcinoma that has a renin secreting tumor? You need to distinguish this, but remember hypertension and hypokalemia tells you that aldosterone is high. So the bottom line take home point, aldosterone brings in sodium and makes you pee out potassium and hydrogen ion. You will thank me once you put that in your mind and get test questions correct. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for your attention. I hope that this was a very quick and high yield webinar for you. Before you leave, I do want to just highlight some of my unique courses that I have for your USMLE preparation. They are all in this very integrative manner. One of the courses that I just released was my test taking strategies course. This test taking strategies course gives you key strategies on how to approach questions. How do you go through a block? It gives you the important element of test taking that many students do a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session for many, many months for, but I've actually just distilled my hours and hours and hours of private tutoring into this very high yield course. So I would really encourage you to check it out. With the test taking masterclass, you get the rapid review course, which covers everything from general pathology to biochemistry to autonomic pharmacology. These are the concepts that you definitely need to know before you walk into Prometric Center. If you're interested in also getting a study schedule and uh, having that for your preparation, I'm very passionate about productivity and feel free to also reach out to me if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one preparation. I do want to close to let you know that I will keep the webinar uh, announcements under the announcements tab of my website. So please keep uh, uh, subscribed to the email list or keep checking in there. And then I have some free resources, the first aid outline, as well as the Golian style course, which is a classroom course that kind of has the highest yield topics from each of the organ systems. And those are absolutely free for you to check out. Before you leave, I want to encourage you to type one thing into the chat box uh, that you learned as well as if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you again for joining, and I'm going to stick around for questions. But remember, type one thing that you learned before you leave.